today in the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be looking into verses 11 through 22 this morning. Sometimes when we study, we'll see things that are condensed because of a certain teaching in a verse or two, and then we'll see things that are just illustrations. So this morning is an illustration. Uh, so I call this the, il- uh, the illustration of unity. Uh, it's just I'm, I make up these titles and it seems to work, so that's what I've uh, got there. Got a few questions in our bulletin and they'll come along. You sometimes may come up with a little different answer than I have, probably not too far different, but it, it just runs in conjunction with the study that I particularly did in this message. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, topical number 821, lesson 10 in the series, Gifts and Agape. Talking about the equality of the gifts, we talked about uh, many of these being um, temporary gifts. Obviously, there are gifts still relevant today, but there were temporary gifts as well as we know back in the day in the early church and the purpose for that and sharing mostly for sharing the gospel primarily in sharing the gospel pointing people to Christ and the power and the demonstration of his power and then a a demonstration of the uh, kinds of tongues and the interpretation of those were languages that were uh, taught uh, not taught but known by the person who was given that temporary gift that they could share the uh, the gospel with others, a language of which the other knew, but the one speaking it did not know. And for anyone that was in the company of those people that heard that, if it was a group, then that person would have the gift of interpreting what had been said to the group. And uh, primarily, though, the, the tongues was given for the lost, not for the saved. It was given to the saved to share the gospel with the lost who didn't know that li- who. who who uh, needed to hear the gospel. And as we talked about it, in the first 30 years of the early church after Pentecost, uh, the gospel was spread throughout most of the known civilized world at that time. Within 30 years, it had gone to China, what we know as China, what we know as Southeast Asia and India, what we know as uh, North and Central Africa, uh, the Mesopotamian area or Southern Europe, and, of course, now uh, that would take you all the way up to what we know today as Russia and Great Britain and the Baltic states and those Germanic people there and their migrations and the Romans and their confluence in that all as well. And then all the way to Rome as far as that part goes. And then wherever the sailors set sail to the to the to the seas, but not so much to the seas in as it was to the civilized world, but they got the gospel very quickly. Those people who heard the gospel in the uh, either at Pentecost, a lot of people there, and a lot of Jews were there. A lot of the gospel went out. A lot of people got saved, and of course the uh, persecution then began, and they, they all set a lot of that. There were those who had gifts of knowledge and gifts of faith to help the church gifts of prophecy, to help the church get going with teaching that had yet to be penned, but would be penned. And then uh, the circulation of the word went out. And eventually, you know, as the circulation of the word went out, the false teachers started to rise because they were reading these scriptures. They did not agree with these scriptures. And then the Jews, of course, who were still with the old dispensation in their hearts, were pushing against these scriptures. And so the early church had a battle on their hand. And then, of course, that didn't include the pagan culture that the Gentiles had come out of and their false gods and their false teachings. And so there was the church has always had resistance. And the church succeeds when it resists. The church never succeeds when it when it submits uh, to its culture. Culture is never Christian culture. The only place where there's truly godly Christian culture is in the third heaven. That's Jesus Christ, because everything else 
is just a facsimile of it, or it's a weak, watered-down version of it. And so we desire through the Word and the Spirit is to become as much like Christ as we can in our thinking, which comes through resident Bible doctrine, what I call fruit knowledge rather than root knowledge is what we'll look at. So the church has always faced resistance. That's not a new thing. And uh, it's important that the church stays in the Word to give the strength to fight because this is a spiritual battle more so than anything else. It's more of a spiritual battle than it is a cultural battle. It's more of a spiritual battle than it is a political battle. And we know it's not a battle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. That's satanic, cosmic uh, resistance to truth. Yet Satan has always resisted the truth. And so we are aware of our enemy and we are aware of the beans and the bullets that we need to do the warfare that is ours. It is our warfare. That is part of the angelic conflict. It is a warfare to which we are engaged, whether we are on the front line or we are in a support role. All are important. When the front line runs out of, of uh, food and medicine and supplies, when the front line runs out of ammunitions and munitions, then the war is going to be lost. And so the people who are in support roles are very important. Communication is very important from the front all the way back to the ops tent. Everywhere you go, first thing we would do is set up an ops area. And we'd set up a perimeter, we'd set up an ops tent, and then we'd set up a perimeter, and it was always a place of security and safety. It was a place where you could kind of get your information, your intel from the field, and then once you got your intel from the field, then you had all your radar set up and you had all that stuff set up. We had our big vehicles out there that would pick that information up, relay that in back to battalion, back to the company, from the company out to the field and from the field. Uh, those squads were alerted to everything that was going on. We were in communication with one another at all times. And most of the time, it was one of them crank radios. I don't know if any of you all ever used one of the crank radios in the field, but I have, and it's a weird feeling at 2 o'clock in the morning to see something coming, and all you got is you, uh, an M16 with blanks and a crank radio. And it's spooky. You don't know what's going on. And then the MPs come up the back roads with their night vision goggles, which they did have then, and let me borrow them, and I saw what I thought I was going to see. <laughs> nice. Anyhow, communication is important. And Satan has a great communication system through powers and principalities and rulers of darkness in this world. They have an intel report coming into Satan in the headquarters all the time. And God has our intel for us given out through the word, through the understanding of the spirit, and through the communicators that God calls, which are pastor teachers. That's primary. Then he has the help and support staff. You've got teachers. You've got administrations. You've got helps. You've got all that support that's necessary. And everybody's important. The reason why I'm saying all this is because there were some who thought because they could speak with a certain gift, which was called glossolalia, tongues, that they were more to be desired than the lesser gifts. Everybody's important. I don't care how well you shoot, whether you're a marksman, you're a sharpshooter or you're an expert. It makes no difference how good you are with your gift. You need support because once the bullets run out, you can point and put, pull the trigger all you want. You got nothing. You're just making a little clicking sound. And so we all need each other. Everybody's important. And we need the rank because the rank is where we are supposed to follow the God on or the colors of our unit. We need that rank. We need that structure. Structure is important. It's important in civilian life. It's important in the church. It's important in the military. And it's important in being successful against the battle against powers and principalities. It's important to have structure. Not this church thing where everybody is running, doing the cray cray and feeling good when they come in. There has to be, Satan wants his, en we are his enemy. Satan wants his enemy to be disorganized and nuts. 
Satan wants his enemy to be listening to loud music rather than studying the Word of God, our combat manual. He doesn't want you studying the Word of God. It's almost blasphemous, even in many Baptist churches, to do nothing more than do evangelism on Sunday mornings. Give the bus report. Give the Sunday school report. Give this report. It's almost blasphemous if you're not doing it like you, you're, you're not following the Bible. That, you teach the Bible. That's the problem. So let's teach it. The illustration of unity. First of all, we remember that the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts of the Spirit severally. Verse 11. All these things, all these gifts work that, but all these work that one and the very same, uh, the self same Spirit just divides up to every man as he will. The word severally means separately. And it's for the work of God in the New Testament as He sovereignly wills. You got thalomai and bulomai are two of the great basic words for the word will. And one of them is a will of God where He gives you room to make your decisions and the other is a decree that God ordains things to be a certain way. So God here decrees, as it were, what he wills for you to do. Now, whether you and I follow it, that's a different story. But there are some things that God says we've got to get on the stick. We've got to get on the ball. Thus, there should be no pride with regard to what your gift is or mine. There should be no self-conceit in our calling as if God called us because we were all that in a bag of chips. Our former pastor, he used to tell me when I went to school, I went to three or four different, well, four different schools that I can think of, maybe five. And he says, you get your education where you can get it, but you get to a church where you can learn doctrine, more importantly, than just have a good school that you can go to and then let them, you need a, he says, you need, he, he was right, you need a pastor that will teach you the word systematically and language wise and in practice and principle rather than just going off to a Bible college and seminary and being spoon fed whatever the philosophy of that professor is because too often men go into the ministry and they follow the philosophy of a professor he becomes a greater influence because he's got a lot of letters behind his name our former pastor had a lot of letters behind his name too but the idea is, is that when you go off to college a lot of times, it's like, well, they're smarter than... No, some teach because they can't do anything else. And some have tenure because they've kissed a whole lot of the board's backside to get that tenure, and they'll talk about anything they want to talk about. And that's not just in liberal schools, but that's in seminaries and Bible colleges too, especially in the seminary level, the postgraduate level. That's when most of these guys get messed up and mixed up when it comes to their theology and their beliefs. Those pastors who go out from those schools oftentimes, their professors have gone down so deep into the woods that they can't see the light of day anymore. And the light that they think they see that's coming from the Word of God is coming actually out of hell. It's coming from Satan's philosophy of human good and whatever else it might be. I've seen too much of that. I believed in God when I went to school. I believed in the inspiration of Scripture when I went to school. And when I graduated, I didn't believe in either one. goes to tell you what kind of professors some of these schools are, are paying off. Satan's in charge of much of that. But there should be no pride or self-conceit in our callings and the gifts God gives us in serving Him as we have no say in the matter of which gifts we received. I, you have no say. I have no say. You just need to go with go with it, you know. That's important to go with it. Ultimately, all spiritual gifts are for worshiping and serving the Lord. That's, I think, one of the questions there. That's what we always have to remember. They are ultimately for worshiping and serving the Lord. Whether it was a temporary gift back in the first century church or the, still the gifts that are being functional today. Those gifts are for worshiping and serving the Lord. They're not for making a profit. Now, the Bible does say that the ox who treads out the grain is worthy of his feed, but that's 
and that there needs to be support so that you can give yourself to, to ministry. That is true. Second Timothy. Paul said, No man that war, Second Timothy 2 4, no man that goes to war entangles himself with the affairs of this life. It's talking about outside business affairs. No entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. In other words, you need to stay focused on what you're called to do as a soldier in that regard. No man that warth goes to war entangles himself with the affairs. And that means, actually, the word there means a business occupation. A business occupation. That he may please him. That is, you know, he wants us to be solely focused on that calling and what, what comes with that. But anyway, the gift is for worshiping and serving the Lord. And obviously not comparing ourselves with ourselves, as Paul noted in 2 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13, which he said, that's not wise. Us comparing ourselves with ourselves, uh, you know. People compare preachers with preachers. They compared Paul with Peter and Apollos, remember, and others. And Paul said, that's not wise to do that. And not only that, but each one that's given the gift that they have, it may be the exact same gift, but it also goes within the measure of that person and their background and their training that they can still be used here or there or wherever. Because if they're faithful to God, they are his mouthpiece. And they'll stay in the word. And a lot of times they're not caught up in a lot of the taboos. There were those who didn't like some of the things that Spurgeon did because some of the things he did was taboo. He liked smoking cigars. And there are people who were offended by that in his day. And he said, well, I don't do it in excess. Moody asked him, what do you mean in excess? And he says, well, I only smoke one at a time. I don't smoke two at the same time. <laughs> but people get offended by things like that. G. Campbell Morgan and others, they get offended. They, they weren't. He wasn't. But uh, some of the others were kind of offended by things of that nature. But anyway, I'm not promoting anything. I'm just saying. We're not going to be comparing ourselves to see if we're more righteous or less righteous than the other person. Chapter 12 and verse 12, Paul's going to give a further explanation of a discourse on the gifts of the Spirit. He says, for as the body is one and has many members and all the members are of that one body being many, there's still just one body and so also is Christ. For as the body, that is the body here now, he's comparing the flesh with the spirit world. For as the body of flesh is one and has many parts, arms, legs, eyes, ears, and all the members of that one body, which are many, are still just one body. You got a lot of parts, but you're still just one body. So also is Christ's body, the church. As seen in Colossians 1.18, Christ is the head of the body of the church. And the universal church is the rest of his body. So the body of Christ is universal. Whoever believes in Christ, wherever you're from, makes no difference. You're part of the body of Christ. And then the local church is the training ground, the training place, the, 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 uh, the local company, as it were, the platoon, if it may be that. The spiritual body of Christ, which is his church, consists of only born-again believers, though there might be unbelievers who attend. The body itself is directed by the Spirit of God indwelling that individual believer and collectively in that individual church. And we have all been those who have been regenerated. We are a believer in Christ if we have been regenerated by faith and that sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, being made anew, palin genesia. We've been made anew is the word there. 
by the Spirit of God. If you and I have not been made anew, we're still at the old man. We're still controlled by the old nature. But if we've been regenerated, as Titus 3, 5 says, by the washing of the water and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, the renewing, regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, then we are born again. We are members of the body of Christ and we are members of one body. We may have many denominations, obviously, in Christianity and non-denominations or interdenominations or whatever, which are denominations within themselves. But if you're a born-again believer, you are in the family of God. You are in the body of Christ in this dispensation, unique to the other dispensations. This dispensation is unique to all the other dispensations or eras of time of God's economy of how he does things. But we are one body. All parts are connected to the head, who of course, is Christ. And so the parts of the body are supposed to follow the direction of the head. If you did not listen to your brain, and your brain did not get that information to the parts of the body, that would be a problem. I mean, this is the main computer thing, the cranium area there, uh, that, that eight pounds of mush or whatever it is. But all the little things that are in there working that God uses. And then the invisible part, will part that actually make it come to life with, which is the breath of life that God gives to it. It says in verse 13, For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body. But for by one Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, were we all baptized into one body, whether we were Jew or Greek, actually the way it is there. Uh, you may have Gentiles. And have all been made to drink into one spirit. Not just some, but all. That's twice the word all is used here in this verse. We were all baptized. For by one spirit were we all baptized. We're all baptized is one word in the Greek text, and it's an aorist passive indicative verb signifying that our spiritual baptism into the body of Christ was a once and for all event. You don't get baptized into the body of Christ two and three and four and five times as those who believe you lose your salvation are proponents. The passive voice means he does the baptizing you or placement of you and immerses you into the body of Christ. Passive voices, subject of the verb, is the rec receiver of the action. And the indicative uh, here, this mood, means that it's without doubt. So we were all, once and for all, baptized as a complete act, not a partial immersion or a probationary introduction to Christianity, but a full, complete immersion and baptism into the body of Christ. So if a person could lose their salvation, the Spirit of God would have to carve you out of the body of Christ. That'd be like somebody carving out your arm or your eye or your ear because it had a problem. It, would, it got an infection. It became anemic. It became weak. It got something in it. Or something happened. No, you try to heal it. The body has healing powers within it. And then sometimes you need some help getting healing done physically. And sometimes God has to intervene from the outside in or as it were inside out to heal us from our spiritual wounds. But God does that. But once you're in the body of Christ, you are in the body of Christ. Also, referring to that spirit baptism, it's in the indicative mood, which means there's no element of doubt. For by one spirit were we all baptized into this body. It is without uncertainty. In other words, Paul is saying you didn't have to be uh, baptized and circumcised to get into the body. You didn't have to be baptized and baptized to get into the body. There are some who believe that if you don't, until you get water baptism, that you're not saved because they put more emphasis that, and they'll dunk you three times. One for the ghost, one for the son, and one for the father. You get three doses when you go down. We don't do like a one dunker here. They go and take you down three times. It's like John Wayne said he had faith in all the major religions because he wanted to hope maybe one of them could get him in. I'm afraid he missed out if that's the case. 
But anyway, for by one spirit will we all baptized into one body, whether we're Jews or Greeks. It makes no difference. In other words, what your background is, you don't stand a bit higher than anybody else. Whether you came from this nation or that nation, you came from this pedigree of family or that, makes no difference to God. Whether you're a man or woman, it makes no difference to God. Black or white makes no difference to God. If you believed on Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's dunked you into the body of Christ. And you're not coming out. You're saved and secured in Him. And so, the, with that said, we need to learn to accept it. And that's grace orientation. And then learn to work together. The moment we believed in Jesus Christ is the very moment we were baptized into the body of Christ, not when we started speaking some gibberish or started performing in a way that suited somebody else's standards. Galatians 3. I'll just... Galatians 3.26, you know, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's the condition, by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Great. When you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were saved all over and forever, and you became a child of God forever. That's a wonderful thing. You're down and out, you feel bad about things, just remember that. That's not gone anywhere. We were spiritually baptized and sealed into one body, Ephesians 1.13. We were spiritually baptized and sealed into one body, whether we were Jews or Gentiles. So that means we need to learn to work to get along. Whether we're black or white, man or woman, we need to learn to work to get along. Whether we're the pastor or we're just someone holds the door, we need to work to get along. One of us is not a bit better than the other. The only one that is better is Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ had a problem uh, with the Nicolaitans. There was that issue of the laity and the clergy, and he did not like that distinction. There was the responsibility and mutual respect, because mutual respect is supposed to go both ways. It's not like everybody's supposed to respect the priest or the pastor, but it doesn't have to go the other way, because respect is what earns respect. And you don't get respect unless you're respectful. That's an important thing for us to always remember, and because we're representing as ambassadors the head, who's Christ. That's the main thing, is the glory of God here. But we were spiritually baptized and sealed into one body, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, as earth citizens, and we have all been made to drink of that one cup. We've all been made to drink, as he said in verse 13. Aorist passive indicative of potizo. We've heard of potable water. That's one of our words here. We've all been made to drink of this potable water, which is Christ. All, not some of us have been made to drink, but all of us. Passive voice. When you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, you're baptized into the body of Christ. We have once and for all received the spiritual drink of one spirit. Not only did the Holy Spirit baptize into the body of Christ, eternal body of Christ, we were saved, but the Holy Spirit came into us just as real as water is swallowed into the physical body. It became a part of you. Of course, it's take up residence in the human spirit where his spirit bears witness with your spirit, of course. The Holy Spirit does not reside in your belly. I'm going to say some folks have a lot of Holy Spirit and some have less. <laughs> but that's not where the residing takes place. So look at the illustration, verse 14 through 19. For the body, uh, the word here for is an explanatory section coming up as well. For the body is not one member but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Yeah. Try cutting it off and see if the rest of the body doesn't hurt. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, it is therefore not of the body? Yeah. If the whole body were an eye, what a weirdo. Cyclops. If the whole body were just an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body was an ear... Where is the smelling? Where is the snoot? Or as we would say in some circles, the elongated proboscis. 
But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as he hath pleased him. Now that is a mouthful right there. I'm not just talking about the physical body. Glad God, he knew where to put, where he wanted to put, where he wanted to put it, for what reason, obviously. But in the body of Christ, it's the case in the spiritual realm. Okay? And if they were all one member, where, where's the body? There's not a body if you leave members out. And now, but now are they many members that have become one body? The body, physical body noted here in verse 14, is not one member but many members or parts. Verse 15, Paul goes on to explain the need for all the parts of the body, whether it is the foot, the hand, both serve a purpose to the body as a whole. The ear cannot see, verse 16, that I am not the eye, which is more readily noticeable than the ear. For most people it is. The ear cannot say, I'm not a part of the body because I am not the eye. You ever hear, you never heard anybody say, look at the color of her ears. No, it's look at the color of her eyes. When you have a little baby, the ears are cute and everything, but you look at their eyes first thing. And then every, all the little toes and their mouth and the nose and everything like that and their ear. But the rest of them is important too. The ear cannot say, I am not part of the body because I am not the eye. I want to bring something out here. The ear does not feel like a victim to the eye and pity itself. Because pity typically leads to self-absorption, which leads to jealousy and pettiness and pride. I'm not getting enough attention, in other words. Everybody has their place and their responsibilities. Now, I can tell you as a mouthpiece for the Lord, and we all are, and to a degree, we're all mouthpieces, but in the local church, in a structural way, there are many times I would much rather be sitting down in the pew with my wife and someone else doing the talking. Much rather. The ear does not feel like a victim to the eye and pity itself. You see, the more noticeable members of the body with perhaps some more noticeable gifts, are not any more important than any other part of the body. It's just that everyone is to function with the grace gift that they have, whether it's a teacher, a pastor teacher, whether it's help in administrations, whether it's help with the young folks that need help, whether it's help with uh, all the needs around the facilities and the Actually, the, all the things nowadays, even more so than it was perhaps back then. You know, we're doing marketing types of stuff, you know. You've got technologies now that weren't available then, so there are things that are being dealt with. Plus, back then you were, the, you were dealing with the poor and the widows that needed a help, especially if, they, if Paul said they were widows indeed, and they would give them support. Of course, those widows would help around the church as much as they could. And first of all, there was a call to the mother to the children of that mother that y'all are worse than infidels if you don't take care of your mama. And he called him out on it. And if he says, if you can work and you won't, then you shouldn't eat either. No pity pots. we got too many pity pots today. Grace orientation gets you off the pot. Grace orientation causes the believer to understand this. That it is not biblical to feel sorry for myself. Because it means that God must have died. And I'm acknowledging that in my thoughts and actions. And God doesn't want this in His church because it's not healthy. And it's not representative of a loving God who hasn't gone anywhere. Jealousy, when that happens, when we understand that we're not to feel sorry for ourselves, then jealousy goes out the window. Competition for attention ceases. Ever seen the Waltons that time that Grandma got mad because another lady was called on to play the organ? She was so happy when that woman flubbed up. And the preacher, whatever his name was, asked her to come back with the, the, the hymns next Sunday. It just tickled her to no end. That's carnality. I was just, I they tried to make it a sweet moment, but that old woman there, she's just carnal. Ellen Corbin, I think's her name. I just called her out on it. 
But it didn't, it pleased her to no end that that woman that was sitting on that bench up there was sitting in her place. Well, we don't have anybody here fighting for the organ. Because if you do, you're more than glad to play it. And then we have a, a baby grand up there, a 70, uh, uh, 84 key baby grand up there, six foot baby grand. You're welcome to come play that too. Now we'd like for you to keep it in within context of our hymn books, but you're welcome to, or at least close to it anyway. Christian music, not cray cray music. But anyway, if the whole body, verse 17, were an eye, where's the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where's the smelling? We can't all be the eye. God made the ear, and it's important because he made it. God made the nose, so it too is no less important as a part of the body. And verse 18, and God put the members of our body where he wanted them, because that is what pleased him. Aren't you glad God didn't put your nose near the armpit? <laughs> but God put the members of our body where he wanted them because that is what pleased him. God knows what he wants done in the lives of not only the people, but being a testimony of his grace in a community. Every part of the body is where it is because God designed it that way. And every part is important. In verse 19, there's no co complete human body if parts are missing. Now, we're not talking about the fact when you and I have to lose a leg or we have a, a kidney taken out or we have tonsils taken out because they need to come out or it, a leg has to come off. We're talking about the spiritual realm here. But a complete human body does have all of its parts. And there is no complete body of Christ if we leave some believers out because we think they're insignificant. Everybody's significant. And everybody needs the same. And here's the thing. Everybody, for the most part, needs the same basic camp. The basic. Everybody needs the same training. And everybody needs the continuing education of the word. Not just the preacher. Don't rely on me to do it all. I can't. Things that y'all have the perception and experience of life for, you'll pick out on things sometimes that I won't see. That's good. Don't rely 100% on me. Never. I'll do the best that I can, but don't. I'm telling you as a pastor, don't rely 100% on me. Does that mean you don't need me? No. But there are some people who go to that extreme and say, well, we don't need you then. I beg to differ. Because my commander-in-chief says otherwise. He puts us in here and puts us together for a purpose. And we all help each other. And there in verse 20, he says, There are many members, but they make up just one body. And the body of Christ does not follow another head. Remember, there are many members, that is, in the body of Christ. And they make up one body, which is Christ. And Christ is the head. And we don't follow another head. We don't follow another voice. And that's why it's important for you not to let other people get in your head. That's one of the things I learned when I was 20-something years old. Don't let other people get in your head. I learned it young. Um, because you're going to be responsible for the decisions that you make, not but the decision that somebody got in your head made for you. Even when a man and a woman get married, they supposed still have an independent head. They have to maintain that independence. One cannot suffocate the life out of the other. You have to have that ability to be independent. Even though you are one, you still have to have a sense of your own autonomy so that you can function and bring something to the game. Something to the wedding, something to the marriage. If you re, if you stop being who you are, you stop being the person that the other one was attracted to. You mesh together, you complement, you don't fight with one another. You mesh together like that. That's a wonderful part of that that thing. But also in the body of Christ, God's not asking you to be somebody else because you're unique, and He needs you to understand that. 
and then to, 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 to take from this and to take from that and to learn from this and to learn from that and, and learn what you don't want from that one. I've got people and you, you probably do too that you read from it. You got something from and you like and the other stuff. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. That's good. You don't have to agree with that person. You don't want to go out and just burn their books because of that. You learn from them. They'll answer for that. Every man stands and falls before his own master. I don't answer for you. I'm not going to answer for one of you. And you're not going to answer for me. You go answer for you. So, not that I'm told you something you didn't already know, but I just remind us here. As Peter and Paul and Mary said one time, some of you got that. I'll call your hearts, your minds to remembrance. But the head directs the body with the Word of God. The head directs the body with the Word of God. If you leave the Word of God, the body has no direction. That's why so many churches are doing so many crazy things because they left the Word of God and they have no direction from the Lord. They're taking a the direction. I've got books some of them which I had to study as a part of my course for my undergraduate in my study that teaches you how to market yourself to promote yourself, to get that right church, to get that thing, and then how to work the staff in your church with a flow chart. I got flow charts, but I don't use them anymore. But to work your staff with that flow chart so that you've got a seamless interconnectivity with the leadership in that church, so much so that they all think in the same accord. Truth of the matter is, though, most of them are not getting the direction from Bible doctrine. They're getting it from some idea that some other church used. This one they used, or that one used. I heard a guy say that it was going to get really loud at their church. It was a posting on Facebook. We're going to get really loud. And so when I went to the website and looked at the website that was being proposed, I listened a while, and the first thing I saw was a speaker on the stage, and it was as big as that wall right there. And the first thing I thought, this is un this is no good. Because somebody is compensating for something. Somebody is like the young, the 18-year-old that's got to have the loudest muffler at the school. Somebody's compensating for something. I can't get attention because I have the emotional ab ability of a six-year-old, so I have to do something else to get the girl's attention. And I've seen girls do the same thing before. I have to wear the shortest skirt in school that I can get away with because I don't have anything else to offer. Really? Y'all know y'all looking at me kind of funny right now, but you know exactly what I'm talking I'm not saying any of y'all have ever done this. I'm just saying. When you have the goods, the people who are spirit motivated will show up. And you've got a bunch of shallow people. You give them something shallow and they'll show up. They don't want you to take, they don't want you taking them too close to Jesus Christ because they'll do like John 6, 66 disciples did, the outlying disciples. They'll walk away and follow him no more. Most likely it's because they never followed him to start with. Just a fashion. It's a, it's an amusement. Like people who would follow Jesus out on the hillside just to see the show, just to see, get the bread. Just to get the, I saw him do this, I saw him do that. That's not salvation. Most of those people probably turned away from Christ and never were saved. There's always some that were. Remember, it's always just a remnant that really follows. Always remember that. When you go to a workforce place, usually it's 20% of the people that you put most of your faith and trust in. Not the other 80%. And you will spend most of your time counseling and working with the 80% who are not as interested than you will with the 20%. They're, they're A-types. And hopefully it's, it's A-types in a good way, not a bad way. I'm talking about alpha mindset, man or woman. They're go-getters. You don't have to do much to motivate a go-getter. Some people, you have to keep a boot in their backside all the time in a nice way to keep pushing them, keep pushing them, keep pushing them, keep pushing them. And other people, you've got to put brakes on them. You know. 
My hands are sweating right now. I think it's just a lotion I put on. I put a non-scented lotion on. That's what's sweating. <laughs> but if you leave the Word of God out, the body has no direction, as we said. And then that's when the devil deceives the body. When the body of Christ, the local church, and the body of Christ as a whole has left the Word of God, then it opens the door because there's a vacuum there and it opens the door for powers and principalities to slip in with something that's a false teaching. It has happened so many times and that's when it happens. False teaching doesn't come in when you're constantly pounding the Word with sound doctrinal teaching. False teaching comes in when there's a vacuum and you've left an empty place and you haven't addressed that issue. And with an expository church, there's times coming when you'll you'll say, well, when's the pastor going to talk a lot about the family? I will get to it. I will address that. When's the pastor going to address this? Well, you have to be faithful to get that because I can't do it all at one time. Not that you can't study it on your own. I hope that you do. But when we're not teaching the Word, that's when deception can come in and something can fill the gap. And typically, it won't come in as something boring. It will come in as something very exciting. Preferably not coming in as Miley Cyrus did on a wrecking ball. <laughs> that was a wreck. But evil will fill the vacuum when holiness is abandoned. Because Satan's always looking for an end. He's always looking for, you know, a crack in our armor. Not just individually. And we know where our weakness is. We know that. So that's why you got to be vigilant to that. Paul said he beat himself black and blue, as it were, to keep from being rendered a useless servant of the Lord. He stayed. He was hard on himself. Didn't give him. He he, he was a lot harder on himself than he was on other people. But evil fills the vacuum when holiness is abandoned. Verse 21, The eye cannot say I have no need of the hand. Sure just come in handy when you want to eat. I see that food there, but I can't get it to my face. I'd have to stick my face in there like a dog. I cannot say I have no need of the hand. I need help. We need help. Nor the head say this to the feet. You got to get me there. I have no need of thee. In the body of Christ, some see the mission and proclaim it. But they can't carry out all the things that are part of the mission or the request or requirement. And I'm talking about not just personal holiness. We're all responsible for that through the Word and through the Spirit. But there are things that God calls us to do at times as well. And the physical body, the head needs the feet to go where the head sends it. Just as the church must follow where Christ our head leads us in truth and in works. So verse 22 and 23 we close up. He says, Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And I said, Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these, we bestow more abundant honor. We protect them. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. So, some seem to be unnecessary. They're not, no, they're not so noticeable. The word feeble, asthenes, A-S-T-H-E-N-E-S, the last one's an eta, not an epsilon. Asthenes means feeble or inner. These are members of the body we think of like heart, lungs, liver, kidneys within the body that keep the rest of the body functioning, processing blood and everything else and securing it, purifying us, cleaning us out, providing the pump that we need. These are not seen. They are not visible. But they are very active and they are certainly necessary. You don't tell these parts of your body, though they are unseen, that they are unnecessary. The same goes for members that are less noticeable in the body of Christ, the church. Paul the Apostle said the power of God was most seen when he was weak. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, same word, asthenes. 
As a matter of fact, without the unseen feeble parts noted in 12 and verse 22, there's no physical life in the physical realm. These internal parts work all the support all the work required for the outer parts for functioning, like the eyes, the ears, the nose, the hands, and the feet, and so forth, as these parts are called on to serve a person so they may support physical life and the continuation of human life for generations to come. The more is known as the uncomely parts. The private parts, in other words, necessary for life to be sustained, next generations to come about. Typically in our day and age, those are the parts that are the most ghastly represented in society among men and women. Is the part that is has to do with the pr progression of humanity in itself, which shows that it is a direct satanic attack for sexuality to be so explicit today. It's a satanic attack. Ponaria is an evil wickedness from the Ponaros one. And it is a, an attack on the future uh, succession of humanity as depositories of the soul which come from God. That's why there's such an attack on men and women sexuality. And there's even attacks so much so today that you're not even supposed to know what gender you actually are. And that's just a direct attack from Satan because it is... It is uh, to confuse people who were otherwise were not confused. And I'm going to tell you, a population that can be confused on something as absurd as that is, an, is a population that has culturally and false education-wise been fed so many lies for so long that they have come to believe that what their liars are saying is true. That's when Satan starts to triumph. That's when the third. That's when the third gate has come in on uh, the uh, on the pigs. Nope, there it is. It's moved on me. That's when the third gate has come in. You seen it? Free stuff. This is not going to be a very, this is going to be a sad looking cow. It looks more like a, a dog. <laughs> All right, let's put some horns here. It's a happy cow though. But oh, there's free food. You've seen it. So after a while they come to eat, then the other, hey, then you go out and you tell the other one, let's make this a little rounder cow with little round feet. Whee, that's a rabbit. It's a three a three legged rabbit. But anyway, then you eventually do this. You've seen you you've heard this illustration, and then maybe you sweeten the pot and give a little bit more. All more come that were people that were more skeptical from out here, you know, little stick figures from out here. Whee, I mean, this is he's got a ball cap on. He's a Yankees fan. He's not very happy. But anyway. You get everybody starts coming. You get different people because you start sweetening the pot because you get something that appeases them. Then you get this one. And eventually after you get them all in there, you know the story. Then you captured them in the boot. And you're going to give them the boot. Whatever. That's not intended to be an art uh, display. Just a point. Don't put that on there. <laughs> Please. But anyway... You get the point is that we can be led to believe something that is right when it is not. And we need to know from the word right from wrong. And Satan doesn't want us to know right from wrong. But when we can work together, uh, we can continue to promote the word and the gospel. And that's what we want to do. Father, thank you for this day and thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. We ask you to help us to get something from these lessons and from your word, we know that it won't return into you void, but it will accomplish what you sent it forth to do. Help us to stay strong in the Lord by your power and your will. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.